God richly bless you tonight. I want to greet you in the exalted name of Jesus Christ, our soon coming King. Praise God. I deem it a privilege one more time for us to be in Bible study. I pray God that as we get into the study tonight, amen, that somebody's faith, praise God, will be increased. Amen. The Bible says faith comes by here. Hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. It doesn't matter what the situations are. There is something about the word, the power of God's word that has the ability, praise God, to lift our spirits. It has the ability to change our minds. It has the ability to do a work amen, in our lives that, like nothing else or no other book can. So tonight I am grateful one more time that we're able to break bread. We're able to one more time to get into what the word of God has to say. Before I start the study tonight, I'm going to ask us to just bow our heads, amen, as we get into prayer first so that we can uh, invite the presence of God, amen, in our midst as we delve into the word of God. Let's pray. Great God, we thank you, God, for tonight. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your love, your mercy, your grace, your loving kindness, which is better than life. We thank you, Lord God, for your word, oh God, your word which comforts our hearts, your word, Lord Jesus, that gives us peace. You said it will keep us in perfect peace if our mind is stayed on you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the living word. You are the bread of heaven, which you have sent down from glory. You are the living word. God, as we are about, Lord Jesus, to get into the word one more time tonight, I pray, God, for every listener, every person who will listening in on this Bible study session. I pray, God, that you'll open our understanding, that you'll give me, God, clarity of thought, and that at the end of the day, God, as we discuss the word of God, I mean, that somebody will be encouraged, that somebody's faith will be lifted, knowing, God, that your word, hallelujah, is reliable. Your word is powerful. Your word is truth. God, you did declare in your word that must sanctify them through thy truth because your word is truth. You said your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Oh God, bless every person here. Bless every person who will participate. Bless every person who will make a comment. Bless every person, God Jesus, who will be willing, Lord Jesus, to open their hearts one more time to receive the word of God the power of the word. Thank you right now, Holy Ghost, as we are about to do, God, your will and your work in the most exalted and mighty name of Jesus, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you again. Welcome to Bible study. I know we had a little break. Praise God. But we are back again to study the word of God. We are back again to continue, praise God, in relation to the studying of the word. Tonight, we continue on the topic that we have been talking on for, uh, for a little time now. Amen. We continue on the topic, the power of the word. And just to bring us up to speed in relation to what we have covered in this series, amen, we started week one with looking at the consequence of sin. And the reason we started here because we want us to understand, amen, the need for the word, praise God. When we look at the consequence of sin, and the key verse that we had there was Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, which says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It was in that lesson that we learned about uh, the branch of theology, that deals with sin and its consequences. And the, the, the word that we learned was the word hamar theology, amen, which practically deals with sin and the, its consequences, amen. From that lesson, the consequences of sin, we looked at the fact that the word sin in the Old Testament comes from a Hebrew word, chatat or chata, and it carries the idea of missing the mark or going astray. We also said that in the New Testament, the Greek word is hamartia, and it conveys a similar 
uh, uh, a similar meaning like the Old Testament word. It simply means missing the mark. Um, we started that lesson by by letting us understand that the, there is a there is a thing about sin. There, there, there is sin is, is 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 the fundamental problem for humans. We spoke about the the deception of sinful thinking and how the mindset of sinful thinking reflects a, a what we call a profound misunderstanding of sin's nature and its consequences. Uh, because we wanted persons to understand that there is a consequence to sin. We looked at seven different uh, things or uh, seven different consequences that come along with sin. We said that sin escalates. So we said sin often leads individuals further than they originally intended. Uh, there's, a, there's a thing that we, we said in that lesson. We said sin will take you farther than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay and cost you more than you want to pay. Amen. We, 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 then we move into the impact that sin will have on others because sin does not, does not only affect you, but it inf impacts others also. So sin exposes others to the dangers, the hurt, and the disappointment. We move into point three, that it was difficult sometimes, the difficulty of repentance. When you start to, to, to mingle around in sin, after a while, your conscience can become seared. Praise God. And, 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 and we, when your conscience is seared, it becomes difficult even for you to repent. We talk about the permanence of consequences. We talk about the fact that temporal blessings can be lost. We talk about the long-term repercussions. And ultimately, what sin leads into is death, uh, which goes back to the key verse that we said, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. But one of the things we realize is that even though sin has caused a separation between God and man, amen, we are grateful that we serve a risen Savior. We are grateful that we are serving a God who did not want us to die in our sins, amen, to be eternally separated from him. So he came and he showed us how we can overcome sin. Apart from the fact that he died, he was buried and he resurrected the third day, praise God. We, in his very life, praise God, lived a life that showed us that there is a way that we can overcome sin. When you have the Holy Ghost, when you have been baptized in Jesus' name and you're walking in the word, amen, you have the ability to overcome sin. So lesson two, we looked at the temptation in the wilderness and the lessons that we could learn from that. Our key verse there was Matthew chapter four from verse one to 12. It says, then Jesus was led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hunger. Amen. It's in that lesson that we learn that temptation comes from a Greek word, perizazo, perizazo, P-E-I-R-A-Z-O. And it actually means to entice or to do evil. Or it simply can mean to test or to try someone's character. I mean, we realize that uh, with temptations, uh, they can come to us from either one or three places. And we spoke about that in that lesson. So the temptation either comes from the devil, it comes from the flesh, or it comes from the world. Praise God. So we realize that these are where temptations come from. And, and we, we match that up with what took place in the garden. We realize that the devil used the same things to tempt us like he did in the garden. And it comes through the loss of the flesh, the loss of the eyes, and the pride of life. But in all of that lesson, we, we realize that irrespective of where the temptation came from, Jesus overcame Amen. These, these tests, he was able to be victorious by using the word. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. It is written, you shall not tip the Lord. He was able to use the word and to use the word of God correctly. Uh, we, we, we made that point in that lesson that it is possible the devil himself will try to twist the word. Amen. But God, praise God, had showed us that we must rightly divide the word. It's important that as children of God, amen, that we don't just read stuff that satisfies what we think, but we read the word, the word of God in context. We read the word of God in a way that supports the grammatical historical method, which was where we went into, into when we went to lesson four. But before we went there, we moved 
understanding the weapon that Jesus used to overcome the word, we say, okay, we need to study more in terms of the power of the word. So in, in, in the first lesson in relation to the power of the word, our key verse was Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. And Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 11, it says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to divide the sunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. We look at Isaiah chapter 55, also in verse 11, which says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in that which I sent it. Amen. In the first lesson, in relation to the power of the word, because now we want to we realize Jesus used the word to overcome the devil. We use that just use the word to overcome the flesh, to overcome the world. And therefore, we, we, we needed to zone in on this. Praise God. So in studying the word, we realize that the word as used in scripture is two Greek words, either the logos or the rima. And we said the logos refers to the total utterance of God. It's the complete revelation of what God has said. Amen. But we also realize that the word can be the rima, refers to the specific saying of God that applies to a specific situation. Amen. So uh, we talk about the complete Bible itself, the logos, the, the, the total utterance of God. But sometimes, in like for example, this Bible study, we are getting a rima. We're getting a specific word that applies to a situation that will apply to what you're going through that will help you to grow from strength to strength. Amen. We noted that the word of God is powerful because it of its source, God is the word. Amen. And the word is God. In the beginning, the Bible says, was the word and the word was with God. Amen. And the word was God. The word is powerful because it was the word that God used to create the universe. The God used to create the heavens and the world. And Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3 says, through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which were seen were not made of things which do appear. And it was from this lesson that we, 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 we tried to garner that we have a responsibility, amen, in relation to the word. It's in our responsibility that we study it. It's our responsibility that we teach others about it. It's our responsibility that we preach it. It's our responsibility that we are not ashamed of it. And it's our responsibility that we teach our children the word. Amen. Then we moved in our last uh, lesson, the power of the word part two, and we look at how now to study because we're, we're trying to break this down. We want to ensure that we, 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 we look at the word of God from every different angle because we want the word of God to impact our lives in such a way that we know how to study. We know how to defend it. We know how to live it. Amen. So how do I study the word of God? And our key verse, there was 2 Timothy 2.15, which says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. And this is important because if Paul is saying to Timothy that he must study to show himself approved, amen, a workman that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing, means that there, and, and, and it means that now you can wrongly divide. I would say that word rightly divide means to cut straight. It's important that when we get into the word of God, we don't just take hearsay. We don't just live based on what uh, we have learned um, just by uh, by hearing. But be like the church of Beria, amen, who are more noble than, than them at Thessalonica. Because the Bible said, they, even though the apostle Paul spoke to them, they looked into the matter to see if it was so. So, so Paul said to Timothy, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. It was in that lesson that we talk about the need for interpretation. And the reason why there's a need for interpretation was because of two reasons. The nature of scripture itself and the nature of the interpreter. So the nature of scripture means that the scripture was not written uh, in, 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 in mo with modern, better yet, the scripture was not written from a uh, Eastern, from a Western perspective, which is where we are. It was written from an Eastern perspective, amen. And therefore, it's important that we get into the grammar of scripture, amen, and we get into the, 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 the history and all of these things that, that, that help us to get into the word. 
So the scripture, the nature of the scripture, we look at the, what we call the grammatical, historical method of interpreting scripture. Then, the, then they will look at the nature of the interpreter, which is us. Because every time we read something, we come to the scripture already with, with a mindset that this is what it means. And we have to be very careful that we don't misinterpret that. So there's a need for interpretation because of our nature and because of how the scripture is. They will look at some biblical uh, interpretation words. For example, we talk about exegesis versus eisegesis. So exegesis means you want to pull the intended meaning out of the verse. Eisegesis means you put your meaning on the verse. And what we do, we don't want to put what we think the verse means. We want to pull out of the scripture what the verse actually means. So we want to exegete and not eisegete. And you learn more about this if you should go to Bible school. But the point is, amen, we want to make sure that we pull the intended meaning out of the verse. Then we look at 10 principles of interpretation and then we look at applying the grammatical historical method. So this is how we, we have covered so far in relation to the power of the word. Uh, they will look at its introduction and they will look at how to study. Tonight, let me slow down now, we're going to look at how to defend the word of God. I want us to understand that we can defend the word. In the next lessons, we'll be looking at how to apply the word of God to our lives. And we'll be looking at the transformative power of the word. But tonight, our focus will be on how to defend the word of God. Amen. We look at the, the power of the word. We look at how to study. Um, we call that hermeneutics. But tonight, we're going to look at how to defend. We call it apologetics. And all of these things that are important in, in terms of looking at the word of God from different perspectives. Amen. So that we can be rounded people of God. We can be rounded children of God in relation to the word. So tonight, how to defend the word. Our key verse comes from 1 Peter chapter 3. And verse 50, it says, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart and be ready always, not sometimes, always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Let me say it again. But sanctify the Lord God in your heart. That speaks to how we approach the word of God. We approach the word of God with a pure heart. Amen. We approach the word of God uh, in such a way, amen, that we are open for God to put wine into our vessels. We sanctify the Lord God in our hearts. And then we are ready to give an answer and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with me is and fear. Amen. Uh, we, we, we're looking at this because what we realize is that many people have attacked the word of God. Amen. People will attack uh, Christianity, will attack the church from different angles. And, and one of the areas where they attack the word, uh, attack the child of God, amen, attack the church is by attacking the word, the fundamental thing that, what, that makes us Christian. But guess what? As I said, Peter said, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. We're also going to take this one also, Jude chapter 1 and verse 3, where uh, we're taking the principle from this. We're not going into the book of Jude, but we're taking the principle of what the verse is saying. It says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. Contend means to, to fight. Contend means you are putting up a defense. You're ensuring that what you believe, you can, you can defend it. So you are earnestly contending for the faith, for the word. The, 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 the faith means, I mean, the full body of facts that we hold, which is the word of God. We are contending for that, which was once delivered unto the saints. Praise God. So let's just get into the whole topic tonight of how to defend the word. And we are still on the topic, the power of the word. Praise God. Now, I want us to understand that within modern age, within this our modern age, skepticism and atheism have seen, uh, have had a significant rise in this time. Some people who are not atheists, 
they will tell you that I believe in God, but they are skeptic in the sense that they, they will say that um, I believe this, but I don't believe that. In other words, they will cherry pick what they want from the word. And, and, and they will do this because they said there are some things in the word of God, amen, that in their minds cannot be true. Amen. There are some stories that it has been so far that they are saying that it has not been proven. Amen. So many have attempted to challenge the authority of the Bible because once you can cherry pick out of it, it means that you are putting yourself in a position, praise God, where you can determine what is truth and what is error. Yeah, but I realize that in doing that, then it gives you a buffet style, praise God, of Christianity. And we have to be very careful that we don't live a life where we cherry pick what we want from it. Praise God. So people have attempted to challenge the authority of the word of God in the sense that, praise God, what they do is they're, they're going to determine what is truth and what is error. I was teaching a class uh, just today and students said to me that, in talking to Trinitarians, praise God, they will tell us that it's better for us to follow what Jesus said over the apostles. Amen. And that is the reason why they would have, they would um, do Matthew 28 verse 19 and not what Peter said in Acts chapter 2. But that is cherry picking because what you're clearly saying is that the Bible does not harmonize. What you're clearly saying is that there are some place that is truth and some place that is error. Amen. And therefore what Jesus said is truth but what the apostles said is error. You know, what you're saying is that there are contradictions in scripture and if you're able to say that then who who then determines where the contradictions are? And if there are contradictions, amen, how do you know that the part that you chose is truth, amen, and the part that you didn't choose, praise God, is error? Or better yet, how do you know that what you are choosing, praise God, is not the section that is that has, has the error, praise God, if the Bible has contradictions? But I'm here to tell us that we don't need to do that. So many skeptics and atheists have been on the scene. Atheists say, look here, they attack the word of God altogether because they are saying that, boy, while it has moral value, they are saying many things in there, the miracles that are recorded, the Jericho wall falling, uh, the, the Noah's Ark, amen, the Garden of Eden, all of these things, they claim to say, boy, this is just a, a myth, a, a story, a myth. Praise God, a story that, that, that really did not uh, happen. But men have made up these stories over time. Amen. They will tell you that most of these things that happen, especially in the age that we call the Bronx Age, praise God, which is way early in the book of Genesis, that these things they said don't happen. But can is there a way to show that these things have happened? So look here, we need to understand that that history and science, among other disciplines, have demonstrated to us that what they say are myths. I mean, what they say is not true. History and science, and among other disciplines that we're going to look at tonight, I mean, demonstrate that these challenges have ultimately proven ineffective. So these challenges that they come up with, that they're saying like there's no Jericho wall or they say that they, they, the Hittites did not live or there were no error of the Chaldeans. I mean, all of these things that they, they have claimed over time, we have realized that through history, through archaeology, through science, I mean, and God, I believe that God does these things so that there can be a conversion between faith and evidence. There's no, there, there, some things, I mean, we leave to faith. Truth be told, if it's not proven, but if we can, at the end of the day, amen, I strongly believe that to strengthen our faith, God has allowed some of these things to be exposed, to be open, so that we as children of God may understand and believe even more that whatever is written in the word of God is truth. We can, we can put our lives on it to say that the word of God is true. So the word of God remains unshaken. We, we can prove its authenticity. We can prove that it's in, infallible and that it's reliable. Amen. It means that um, 
it is it is it's authentic i mean what is written there you you it can you can you can it, it allows your life it guides your life all of these things it's there it's infallible it has no error it's reliable it, 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 we we can we, everything that the word of god says is true so as we delve in our study this evening we are coming to the scripture with the presupposition that the scriptures are trustworthy and dependable. Amen. Now, let me first say that in the ancient Greek society, the legal uh, systems normally have what is called, they, they, they have a way of how they would handle disputes and accusations. And they had a way of how to address these things and how to have them resolved. Hence, in the Greek society, when an accusation was made against someone, it was called, in the, the Greek word for that was the categoria. Amen. So it's a verb which means to accuse or to charge. I must say before, in the ancient Greek legal system, it refers to a formal accusation or charge brought against an individual. And this accusation could pertain to any anything like criminal conduct or moral failing or any form of transgression. But what was important is that they allowed this, they, they created this environment where when somebody have an issue, they are able to bring what is called a category, amen, to against somebody. They were able to, to accuse the person or to charge the person, amen, in relation to what they say is truth or not. So you did something or they don't believe it, you are given the audience to make your point that, look here, I am bringing this against you. However, on the flip side, the person who is accused would have responded and 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 and, and to respond, to, to respond, that defense is known as a apologia, praise God. And, and I know that these words are a little bit new, but the apologia practically is uh, you responding, making a formal rebuttal or defense. So where the accused sought to refute the charges or to present counter arguments or to provide evidence of their innocence or their justification for their action, it was called an apologia. Now, this is where we get the term apologetics from. So in the Christian sense, we look at the, the, the old Greek justice, judicial system, and we look at the category where somebody brings an an accusation against the church, accusation against the word of God. They are saying, look here, the word of God is not true. It's not scientifically correct. It's not biologically correct. It's not, um, in terms of chemistry and science, it's incorrect. Amen. It's not historically correct. And they will make these things. But I'm saying, as a child of God, we can bring an apologia. Amen. Which means that we are, uh, praise God, denying the accusations but we are actually also bringing a structured or a reasoned argument aiming to defend our honor, aiming to defend our beliefs. So it required uh, the accused, amen, to articulate their case clearly and persuasively. And what sometimes in doing apologetics, it appeals to things like logic, it appeals to things like evidence, it appeals to, to moral and social norms of the time. We want to ensure that whatever we say, it is clear to the individual. So in Christianity, there is a there is a field that is called Christian apologetics, where we come to defend, amen, praise God, the faith. It means a reason, defense, or argument in support of something. And what I'm here to tell us tonight is that irrespective of the arguments that come against the church, irrespective of the arguments that come against the word of God, praise God, there is a reasoned defense. There are arguments. There are facts, praise God, that support what we believe. And tonight I'm going to give us a touch of some of the things that we believe 
and some of the things that we hold dear, but not just from a place of just a mere just reading out of the word, but there are external evidences that point to the fact that what was internally written is true. Let me say it again. There are external evidences. There are things that we can find in archaeology. There are things that we can find in history. There are things that we can find in biology. There are things that we can find in chemistry, amen, in cosmology that supports the fact that what is in the word of God that was written long before some of these, these modern things were developed were true. So let's just look at defining again some of the terms that we just Use. We talk about the categoria just to, to, to bring home the point. And it comes from the Greek verb, which means to accuse or to charge. We talk about the apologia, which means which which come from uh derived from a word which means to speak in defense or to justify oneself. And then we say from these these two, praise God, the category and the polygia, which comes out of the Greek justice judicial system, we come up with Christianity, what is called apologetics, more rightly Christian apologetics, which biblically defined is the practice of providing reason, defense, and explanation of the Christian faith. Tonight, as we are going to try to converge faith and evidence, there are certain words that we bear in mind. We want to investigate we want to investigate, are there physical evidence that support uh, the things that the Bible talk about? Are there, are there physical evidence for the biblical records that are stored in scripture? Amen. We want to understand some things because did the Bible give us an understanding of how to do hygiene and medicine and, and, and all of these things that are now in this present time in modern science? We want to explore we want to understand early, we want to look at early understanding of how people preserve things or how cleansing was done or human psych um, physiology was done. We want to align, we want to, we want to look at biblical scripture with, with, with contemporary cosmology and earth science. We want to align what, what the word of God says. Does, does this present cosmology aligns with it is their contradictions is that case where a society had it wrong a long time and the bible had it right and we're and, and society is just catching up with what the bible already told us years ago we want to defend it at the end of the day amen the integration of faith and empirical evidence through biblical analysis we want to ensure that at the end of the day amen we have historical validation of biblical narratives through archaeology we want to look at the scientific insights Amen. And the principles embedded in biblical texts. We want to look at the biblical foundation for reflecting modern things like chemistry and biology. Amen. We want to look at uh, astronomical and physical descriptions in scripture. Because while these things exist, like the, the sheep of the earth, all these things, did the Bible talk about these things? And therefore, at the end of the day, we're going to give an apologetic perspective on the reliability and the relevance of what the Bible is saying, the biblical teachings. Amen. It wants us to understand, brethren, what, 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 what you walk around with every Sunday when you open to read it. Amen. It's not a normal book. Praise God. It was God's word and God knew the beginning from the end. Amen. It is God's word and whatever is in there, praise God, is truth from Genesis where Moses word wrote um, the, 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 the law. Amen. All the way to the book of Revelation where John wrote, amen, over that period of time where these 40 writers came, over that period of time where men from different walks of life were able to write, amen, but it says that, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, where God breathed, praise God, his word, wants us to understand that it's not no simple book. And you can rest assured that there is a power in the word of God, amen, that is able, praise God, to keep you. If it's historically reliable, if it's if it has by, if we can prove that everything that 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 is internally written, praise God, in the physical sense, amen, uh, external things are there to defend it. Then guess what? Why then we can rest assured that if if it was right in relation to the, the things that people got wrong, that it's right in relation to me getting saved. It is right in relation to how I should walk. It is right in relation to things like things that we cannot see, like heaven, and in relation to things that the angels, praise God, and the fact that we have our hope, praise God, the fact that, look here, irrespective of what is happening, the word of God stands true. Tonight, let's just take a journey 
on the conversion of faith and evidence as we try to look at the power of the word in relation to how to defend it. Now, as we're going to converge, as I said, uh, history and archaeology and scientific insight and cosmology and earth science and chemistry and biology, we're going to try to break this down uh, into these four different sections. We're going to look at examples, praise God, from history and archaeology. We're going to look at examples from science and, 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 and cosmology and chemistry. And we're going to try to, to see if what we have in present time, the Bible spoke about this in any way. And if the Bible spoke about these things, praise God, is it is the case then that we can rest that the word of God is true? So our first focus tonight is on the historical reliability of the scripture. We're going to realize that archaeology discoveries have consistently affirmed the historical narratives found in the Bible. Events and places that people thought were myth, we have found uh, we have substantiated by tangible evidence. And because of this, the Bible's historical account provides a firm foundation for our faith. That's where we're going to start tonight. Then we're going to look into the, the scientific insights. We'll explore the scientific insights found in the Bible. So while the Bible is not primarily a scientific textbook, Whatever it does mention about the natural world aligns with true scientific principles. We're going to realize that how scriptures have touched upon various scientific truths long, long years before modern discoveries. And what is going to demonstrate to us its profound depth of understanding is going to cement the fact that this must be God. We're going to look at cosmology and earth science. So we'll examine the Bible statement about cosmology and earth science. So long before things like telescope and advanced technology, long before men were able to look out of space, amen, the scriptures, the ancient word of God, that Bible that you walk around with, reveals insight to us into the nature of the universe. And that the earth, praise God, that aligns with what science has no or is now discovering. We're going to look at chemistry and biology. Lastly, we will look into chemistry and biology. We're going to look at how the Bible describes, um, um, or better yet, how the Bible harmonizes between faith and the natural world through chemistry and biology. Let us jump into this and let us try to, to, to show the conversion of faith and evidence as we continue to explore the power of God's word. Now, let's start with history and archaeology. Tonight, I want to start with a story from Joshua chapter 6 and verse 20. The Bible says that the, 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 the backstory behind Joshua chapter 6 uh, is really about a city that was called Jericho. And it was one of the key events in Israel's conquest of the promised land. And if you can remember, it was under the leadership of Joshua. And it is believed according to history that this event happened about 1400 BCE. And some source suggests that it's about 1200 BCE. Um, the date but tonight is not important because some would debate that's about 1400, which I kind of hold closer to because of certain reasons. But whatever, some person will date between 1400 BCE or closer to 1200 BCE. If you can remember, after the death of Moses, Joshua became the leader of the Israelites and they were on a mission to, to conquest Canaan, which was the land that God promised them. God took them out of Egypt. He brought them through the wilderness. He brought them through Sinai region. And now they were about to conquer Canaan, the land that God promised to them. We can remember in about that Joshua sent two spies to Jericho to gather some intelligence on the city. And we find that in Joshua chapter 2. Amen. And it was in this story that they, they, they hid like Rahab, who was a prostitute. And 
And Rahab asked them for her protection and for the protection of her family when they returned. So she was able to, to, to protect the spies, that is Rahab, and in return, they were supposed to protect her and her family. Remember that the spies that went over agreed and they escaped. And they reported back to Joshua about the, the city's vulnerabilities. Now, you read later on that God provides Joshua with specific instructions for capturing Jericho. And this is very important because what we're going to realize is that as we are talking about history and archaeology, you're going to realize that God will give us specific instructions about how to do some things. Amen. But, you know, because we, it's not how we think, we, we kind of put God in a box in relation to what we think. But God provides just with specific instructions for capturing this place called Jericho. What were they supposed to do? They are to march around the city once a day for six days. And they're supposed to do that with the Ark of the Covenant. So once a day for six days, they were to march around the city of Jericho bearing the Ark of the Covenant. Very important. The presence of God have to go with you. So while you're obedient to what God says, there's a principle here that they had to bring the ark. Now, seven priests were to carry trumpets made of what we call ram's horn ahead of the ark. Praise God. Now, for six days, the Israelites followed God's command, marching around Jericho in silence except for the sound of the trumpets. But on the seventh day, they are to march around the city seven times. And on the seventh day, after completing the seventh circuit around the city, Joshua commanded the people to shout. For God has given them that particular city. And we start in Joshua chapter 6 and verse 16. And this shout combined with the blowing of the trumpet is a display of their faith and their obedience to the word of God. And this brings us to the verse that I want to read that is on the screen. It says, so the people shouted when the priest blew with the trumpet and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat so that people went up into the city, every man straight before him and they took the city. And I said before, this event happened in about 1400 BCE and 1200 BCE. Now, you can imagine the Bible giving a record of this. And for years, they have been searching to see, okay, did this event really take place? Can I trust that this event actually happened? Brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you that in 1930, an excavation by a guy called John Karstang, and later by Bryant Wood in 1990s, have found collapsed wall and evidence of a sun destruction layer in the ruins of Jericho. And guess what? That was consistent with the Bible account. What you're looking at on your screen, praise God, is practically an excavation that was done showing the collapse of the Jericho wall. Exactly, and in the same region, that they thought was a fairy tale happened 1400 BCE, but archaeology has confirmed the historical record in Bible. So John Karstang in 1930s found this. Later, we see where Bryant Wood in the 1990s have found the collapse wall. So if you can look at let me read what is there. It said the walls of Jericho fell in 1406 BCE. Bryant Wood atop the retaining wall of the earthen embankment pointed to the remaining bricks from the mud brick walls that fell. Garstang found imitation crypto wear in his excavation and would re-examine Ken's pottery and prove she misdated it. So there was a there was a misdate between these two. We're not getting to that. But the point here is that he realized that, look here, the walls of Jericho actually did fall. Even though there's a debate between uh, Bryant Wood 
and this other person came on about the date. Some say it was in the Bronx period. Some say it was in this time. It doesn't matter. What I'm here to prove tonight is that the word of God told us that the children of Israel marched around the wall. The word of God told us that on the seventh day, they marched around it seven times. They made a shout and a wall fell. And guess what? Here it is that archaeology saw and come to the conclusion that, look here, this thing actually happened. We are seeing the remains. We are seeing the stones. We are realizing that, look here, something happened here. As a matter of fact, when they did this study here, they go as far to realize that something, some shaking happened and the walls literally fell just like the Bible said. Let's move on to another example because we want to make these points in terms of history. You're talking about the Hittites. Now, in Genesis chapter 23, it describes how Abraham, after the death of his wife, Sarah, he had negotiated to purchase a cave uh, at a burial site. And the, 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 the negotiation took place between Abraham and Ephraim, the Hittite, in the presence of the Hittite community. Now, one of the things why I brought this up is because from years, it is said that, see it, Genesis cannot be true because nothing they found in reference to this Hittite set of people. They said the Hittites did not live. They were not, they, there is no nation. You, can, you might find history about the Canaanites or you might find history about the Perizzites, but who are the Hittites? Amen. So for years, the, the, the skeptic have said, look here, you see why we can't hold on to Genesis? Because here it is that Abraham is making a negotiation with a set of people that there is no history of. Now, what we get to realize is that, let me tell you first, that the Hittites were an ancient set of people who established an empire in a region now known as Turkey and northern Syria. Uh, and they reached their peak around 14th century BCE. That's, that, that's what we read from the Bible. But they could not find anything. But guess what? In the 20th century, because God let God's word be true and every man a liar, Although it was mentioned several times in the biblical text, the actual existence of the Hittites was largely forgotten until about the late 19th century CE, where they discovered, and this was about 1834 CE, just the other day, about over 100, we're in 2024, about 200 years. So, in the 19th century, they discovered of what is called Hattusa, the city that was for many years the capital of the Hittite Empire. And guess what? The Hittites were finally recognized as one of the great superpowers of the ancient Middle East. So here it is on our screen. We realize that this is a discovery that they found. And they found it because of the inscriptions that were written on certain things. So one started to be a biblical myth. The Hittites were confirmed by the discovery of their capital and the records in the modern day Turkey in the early 20th century. What am I saying, brothers and sisters? Even if it's that thousand years or four thousand years or three thousand years, God's word is true. Even if you don't get the evidence yet, at the end of the day, God is going to prove to you. For years, uh, skeptic atheists have made the point that, look here, the Bible can't be true because you talk about your Hittite people. If you look at ancient atheists, they hold that thought. But God just put a stop to their mouth like he did with the lions in Daniel's den. Stop their mouth for them to understand, even through archaeology. Amen. These men have no reason to, to, to they, it's not that they're doing it. The, the, the archaeologist is not doing it just that they can support the Bible. But God used them so that it supports the Bible. And brings about the historical reliability, the historical truth, praise God, of the word of God. So they found the Hittite city. Not only that, they found some things there. They found some, some artifacts there. So the rediscovery of the Hittite was one of the major archaeological achievements of the last century. The Hattusa, their capital, has been declared as a world heritage site. And in 
Lastly, this tablet that we see really was a peace treaty signed between the Hittite Empire and the Egyptians in about 1258 uh, BC after the famous Battle of Kadesh. So that what we see in our screen, when they read what is on it, I must say before, it, 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 they, they realize that what is mentioned on it is the name of the king who was writing a treaty between himself and the Hittite Empire. So the king of Egypt was writing a treaty between himself and the, 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 the king of Egypt. So the Hittite Empire and the king of Egypt was made a treaty after the, the Battle of Kadesh. What am I saying, brothers and sisters? You can bet your life upon the word of God because it is true. You can bet your life anything that they say was not true. Any story you read, amen, it is true. You talk about the children of Israel walking through the Red Sea or the Reed Sea, depending on how it is really um, 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 pronounced. It is true because they have found things for that. Let's jump into one more. You talk about King Hezekiah's tunnel. Now, I want us to understand that when King Hezekiah was king, amen, there was a tunnel that was constructed to secure a reliable water supply for Jerusalem because they were anticipating a siege against, uh, particularly against the what we call Assyrian Empire. And, and I think it was King Sennacherib who was the king at the time. So in 2 Kings chapter 20 and verse 20, it mentions that Hezekiah was that uh, what we call a construction project. Amen. And what he was doing, he was building a tunnel. He was building something that would divert water from Gihon Spring that was located outside of the city walls into the reservoir inside the city, now called the Pool of Siloam. And that's mentioned in the New Testament. So Hezekiah ensured that the inhabitants of Jerusalem would have access to water during the siege. And while denying it to the beseeching force. So at the end of the day, people would not know about it, but Ezekiah built it and the Bible records it. So in 2 Kings chapter 20 and verse 20, this is what the Bible says. Look what it says. It says, and the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and all his might and how he made a pool and a conduit and brought water into the city. And they are they not written in the book of the Chronicles and of the kings of Judah. So here it is that he's talking about this thing that Hezekiah built. For years, people again question it. Where is this place that Hezekiah said that he built? A tunnel that Hezekiah said that he built that would have brought water from one place, from Gihon Spring into Jerusalem. Where is this place? By the way, that story that I spoke about is also found in 2 Chronicles chapter 32 and verse 30. It says, it was Hezekiah who blocked the upper outlet of the Gihon Spring and channeled the water down to the west side of the city of David. He succeeded in everything he undertook. And, and I'm not quoting the KJV in this regard, but I'm quoting 2 Chronicles chapter 32 and verse 30 from an English version of the Bible. So for years again, they questioned this. But guess what, brothers and sisters? In 1838, they discovered the tunnel. My God. And guess what? It was, it was in alignment. It was so to the T in terms of what Hezekiah designed. When they look at it, everything that was said about the tunnel was in line. You could see the watermarks that the water elevated to about 636 feet, but sorry, 636 meters. You could see all the different markings that showed us that look here, what the Bible spoke about was true. Not only that though, there is also evidence that they, they found writings, I mean, that, that, that had the inscription that showed that, that look here, this is tunnel was constructed by Hezekiah's workers. They call it the Siloam Inscription. I was found in 1880. The tunnel is a remarkable feat of what we call ancient engineering. It's run about 553 meters, which is about 1,750 feet. 
and it was built through solid rock. It, it, and guess what happened? You might say, because oh, one of the things that they said is that they did not have the technology to build such a tunnel at that time. But guess what? What they thought could not be done. The Bible said it was done by Hezekiah. It was done to protect Jerusalem. And in 1838, they found the tunnel. <laughs> what am I saying, brothers and sisters? That what the word of God says is true. We can hold it. They discovered it. And it's an alignment what the Bible has to say. It shows us that water passed through the tunnel. It showed us that, look, the tunnel actually exists. And they found it. I mean, I saw, I'm sorry I didn't show you the, the, how it was a map of how it looked under ground going right into jerusalem but what is important is that it shows that the construction started and ended just like the bible said one more from archaeology we talk about Ur of the chaldeans in genesis chapter 11 the bible talk about god calling abraham better yet abram who was later abraham and call him from uh after the after the death of haran who was the brother of Abraham, he was called from the city of Ur of the Chaldeans. So the Bible says, and Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldeans. And for years, people have questioned that, look here, where is Ur of the Chaldeans? Where did Abraham leave from? Where did God call him from? If the word of God is true, where did the term Chaldees come from? You know, they, they, they question all of these things from a historical perspective. Amen. But guess what happened? Again, archaeology proves it right. The ancient city of Ur, mentioned as Abraham's birthplace, was uncovered in modern-day Iraq in the 1920s by a, guy, by a guy called Sir Leonard Woolley. Here it is that we are looking at this archaeological site. So it's the ruins of Ur in modern Iraq, the current scholarly consensus of the city of Ur, Kazdim. So by doing excavation in the early 20th century, it shows us that, look here, the story of Genesis chapter 11 is true because they found writings that prove to us that this place was true. Let's take one more. Solomon Gomorrah. Very important. Now we know the story of Solomon Gomorrah. God called Lot and say, come out of this particular place. And he's going to exercise uh, judgment upon these set of people. Amen. We know what happened when God rained on brimstone and fire, sulfur and fire from heaven. And it, it practically annihilated or, annihilated or destroyed the city and their inhabitants. We know that from Genesis chapter 19, verse 24. But guess what happened? We have found that city. And how they know that is that city is because in that particular location, they found a ruin in, a, in, 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 in the Middle East. And what they found was that they found that sulfur ball and all of these things were there. And guess what? It was there in such a pure form that I said, boy, this thing is not a body put it here. It, 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 it rained from heaven. They, but they did a chemical analysis on the, the sulfur that they found. It was pure sulfur. And it, it also shows us that, look here, there was a destruction that took place. But this is one of the most provocative evidence that, that, that we can find in recent time. We signed, we signed the whole form of the, the sulfur ball and the, the layers of ash in this excavation site. Just like the Bible said. I love it. So, researchers come to the conclusion that, they, that something happened in this particular region. They, they say some meter or some comet explosion in the atmosphere could have caused a massive firestorm creating fire and brimstone. And it sounds just in alignment with what happened. God rained down fire and brimstone. And this is the site, as you're looking at your screen, 
of that particular place. So they found Solomon Gomorrah, that place that was destroyed. So I brought all of those things from a historical perspective for us to understand that the Bible is historically reliable. If the Bible is historically reliable, that means the track record in the Bible is also reliable, which means then, brothers and sisters, that we can say, if what the Bible says it did for people in the Old Testament, he was able to bring children of Israel out of Egypt and bring them to Canaan. It means that God is able to bring me out of sin and bring me to a promised land. He was able to protect them. He was able to keep their clothes. Nobody's clothes got destroyed in all their walking for those 40 years. It means that God can keep me in a time where things look hard, where like, like things are not going to work out. God has to preserve history. He has a track record, as one preacher would put it. And his track record shows us that if he was able to do these things and, 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 and all internal things that the Bible says, we are proving now to be true historically through archaeology, that we can look at the moral things. We can assign it to, to, to all the faith things that we realize that God can protect you. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade upon your right hand. We can hold to the word of God. Praise God. Now let's look into scientific insights. I want us to understand that the Bible itself is not only historically in terms of places reliable, but even things like hygiene and disease prevention way before modern science, modern practices for disease control came into being. We realize that the children of Israel got this from God. They understood when they read like the book of Leviticus and the book of Numbers and, and the law. They understood things like quarantine and waste disposal and the importance of cleansing and washing. They got this when other people had it wrong and were doing other practices. The children of Israel understood this. Let us look at some scriptures that support this point. First, look at quarantine. The Bible says that in Leviticus chapter 13, verse 45 to 46, it says, And the leper in whom the plague is, his clothes shall be rent, and his head bare, and he shall put a covering upon his upper lip, and shall cry, Unclean, unclean. All the days wherein the plague shall be in him, he shall be defiled. He is unclean. He shall dwell alone without the camp, shall his habitation be. When we analyze the verse, we realize that what the Bible was practically teaching the children of Israel was the whole idea of isolation of individuals who had certain infectious disease. Now, what does that sound like? It's akin to our modern practices of quarantining to prevent spread of disease. And, and we are fully aware of what quarantine looks like. Because in recent time, we were exposed to COVID. And they will tell you that you need to stay home. And if you're home and you catch COVID, then they will tell you that you need to stay away from the rest of your family. You have to, to, be, you have to be isolated. Now, modern science came up in recent times with the idea of isolation. But guess what? Way back... From early in Bible time, when the children of Israel were not even yet at the promised land. Because when the book of Leviticus was written, it was written while they were in the Sinai region. When Moses went up into the mountain, amen, they spent a couple months at Sinai, Moses getting the law. And it was at this point in time where the whole issue of quarantine was given to Moses to give to the children of Israel through God. What am I saying? Is that the Bible is scientifically correct from long time look at stuff like water or waste disposal it says in Deuteronomy chapter 23 verse 12 to 13 thou shall have a place also without the camp wherewith thou shall go forth abroad and thou shall have a paddle upon thy weapon and it shall be when thou wilt ease thyself abroad thou shall dig therewith and shall turn back and cover that which cometh from, from thee as Things that we are doing where we are talking about waste disposal. Even God tell them basic things like that. We find in the word. It shows us that the word of God, this Bible that we have is a powerful book, you know. So when we analyze Deuteronomy chapter 23, we realize that God is so detailed that he even 
show them how they should manage human waste and how they should ensure that it's away from the living area. And guess what? When you look at that, it mirrors, brothers and sisters, what, what we call our modern sanitary practices. I would do that so that we can avoid contamination and disease. But guess what? We just getting it in modern time. But God told the children of Israel, and when I say modern time, you might say, okay, yeah, but trust me, it's within the last probably 100, 200, 300, 400 years, 500 years. They, they call these things modern practices or modern sanitary practices. But as far back as the book of Deuteronomy, as far back as the earliest of times when they were getting the law, the word of, the word of Deuteronomy means second law, when they were getting the law from God, amen, we realize that God is telling them how they should deal with human waste. Virgin, the word of God is, is, is as proven to us that it is scientifically correct. Not just it's historically true archaeology, but even how we do simple things like these. How we manage human waste and, and how we how us live among each other and the practices, sanitary practices that we put into place. The Bible itself proved that. Let me show you how, how detailed the Bible is. There was a guy by the name of Ignaz Cyril, we can't pronounce his name properly, right? But in the 1840s, he was a, what we call a Honguran physician. And he worked in Vienna General Hospital. And he observed the difference in mortality rates between two maternity wards. Now, what did he discover? He realized that the wards where people were washing their hands with chlorinated lime solution under running water before examining patients, people there was less, far by far less mortality than the ones who would have washed their hands and go. And, they, and, and, and in, in, in a similar case, a lot of babies were dying too because what they would have do, a surgeon would have done the thing, and then they would have this basin with water in it. He would wash his hand in that and go do something else. And then when he's finished with that, he go wash his hand in that. But here this guy start realizing that between the two wards, there were some nurses who were practically using a solution, a chlorinated lime solution, and they were washing their hands under running water. And guess what? The person, the, the ward that was practicing that, there was far less mortality than the ward that actually just washed them hand like that. Now, why is this important? You know that from his observation, there was an implementation of hand washing protocol. And guess what? It led to a dramatic reduction in mortality rates. And there were less persons dying of fever and other infectious disease. Now, he discovered this in 1840. But look at Leviticus chapter 15 and verse 30. When God was dealing with the children of Israel, he told them something. He says, and when he had an issue, his cleanse of his issue, then he shall number to himself seven days for his cleansing and wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in what? Running water and shall be clean. And there are more. I just pulled out one. When you look at this, we should analyze this verse. We realize that it is talking about washing garments in running water. And guess what? That's aligning with contemporary practices for maintaining hygiene and reducing disease transmission. I could add more to tell you that in the book of Numbers, they used to use the ashes from the heifer as, and it would prove like a, 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 a modern soap type of thing. As early as the book of Leviticus, they had the cleansing and the washing thing to the T. What am I saying, brethren? We can defend the word of God because it's historically correct. We can defend the word of God because it's scientifically correct. Amen. All the practices of hygiene, all the practices of cleansing and washing, all of these things, while we are discovering these things today, 
the Bible already told, it is already recorded in the Bible thousands of years. In other words, we are catching up in modern science with what the Bible already taught us years ago. Let us move to chemistry and biology. Because we want to, to make this thing rounded as possible. No, the Bible teaches us something. The Bible tells us that blood is the source of life. But for centuries, doctors were practicing what was called bloodletting. It was a practice of removing blood. And they thought that when you got sick, that the sickness was in the blood. And in order to cure you, they had to remove the, the blood. It was believed that to balance the body's uh, fluid, they, were to, they, they, they had to remove the blood from you. And that came out of what you call ancient Greek medicine. And to make the point that it is something that was practiced, there are some prominent cases that I, when doing research, realized that people actually died by doing this. So for example, George Washington, who was the, the president of the United States, he got sick. He fell ill with a throat infection. And what did the doctors do? The doctors decided that they were going to perform an aggressive bloodletting. Bloodletting, let me say before, is to remove the infected blood. And they removed nearly 40% of George Washington's blood volume. Now, what was the outcome of that? The excessive blood loss likely contribute, not even likely, the excessive blood loss contributed to his death. And it demonstrated that there's a danger in bloodletting. In lieu of understanding the life-preserving nature of blood. So in that time, the doctors would have been doing bloodletting. They would have been removing the blood to cure you. And we saw where they tried that with George Washington because of his throat infection, but he eventually died as a result of losing too much blood. Not only him alone, look at King Charles, who was the king of England in around 1685. He was treated with bloodletting after he suffered a stroke. What was the outcome of that? His condition only got worse. <laughs> My God. And guess what? He died. And it shows us that there is a tragic consequence for practicing bloodletting. But what did the Bible teach us? The Bible says in Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For the blood, it is the blood that make an atonement for your soul. But the point I want to highlight is the first part, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. When we look at Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11, it serves as a profound testament to the importance of blood, both in sustaining us physically, both in helping us to be revived. The verse acknowledges the vital role of blood in life process. And guess what? It's akin to modern biology which shows that blood is essential to us for oxygen transport, for nutrition distribution, for waste removal, and, and, and all of these things. So now when people get sick, the first thing we hear people saying, okay, this person is in the hospital and they need what? Blood. No more are they doing bloodletting, but now they are requesting blood. But as far back as Leviticus, Jesus, the Bible, Jehovah God, let us understand that the life of the flesh is in the blood, my God. And guess where it is found? In the power of the word. The word of God teaches us that. Look at salt. Bishop Daly was talking about salt recently, but look at salt in terms of chemistry. The Bible use of salt in Leviticus preserving sacrifice demonstrate that in early, early time, they understood that salt pres had preservative properties. Let's look at what the Bible says about salt. In Leviticus chapter 2 and verse 3, it says, And every oblation of thy meat offering shall thou season with salt. 
Neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy meat offering. With all an offering thou shalt offer salt. When we analyze the verse, we realize that it is saying that the requirement to season all offering with salt indicate an early recognition of its preservative qualities. So salt was essential in preserving the integrity of the offering. How do that? It, pre it, it prevented the offering from being decayed. It, 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 it maintained some form of purity. And guess what? It was done through salt. Look at other verses. It says, And thou shalt offer them before the Lord, and the priest shall cast salt upon them, and they shall offer them up for a burnt offering upon the Lord. I remember years ago, uh, Pastor Wong talked about salt offering. Praise God. So when we talk about salt, the use of salt in sacrificial rituals emphasize its role in purification and preservation. And this scripture is talking about salt offering. But guess what? At the end of the day, it was used to do a couple of things. And as early as Bible time, they understood that salt can preserve by, by pre preventing bacterial growth. It, it prevents bacterial growth by creating a, what we call a hypotonic environment. So when salt is added to food, it draws water out of the bacterial cell through osmosis and it causes them to dehydrate and die and become inactive, thus preventing spoilage. That's why when you add salt to stuff, it prevents it from spoil. Because drying and curing, salt helps to, to in drying and curing process of meat and fish. By reducing the water activity in food, right? So it makes salt and our salt make the environment inhospitable for microorganisms, which rely on moisture to thrive. And guess what? As early as Bible time, God said, must preserve things with salt. Things that we are learning in modern time is only coming up in alignment with what the word of God says. And why do I bring out all these examples? For us to understand that the cure. The word that you have, brothers and sisters, is so accurate to the T. Not only that, it, 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 it enhances flavor and texture. All of these things are maintained, but guess what? The Bible tells you these things from way back. Because one, one day, one day, um, when they actually use the salt to, to prevent spoilage, after a while, some of the things that were sacrificed, the, the, the priest would have gotten it for food. Amen. But it is used to enhance the taste and to preserve the thing. Chemistry and biology and, and, and time with film. There are so many examples that we could go into. Let's look at cosmology and earth science. Now, while early civilization believed that the earth was flat, the Bible accurately describes earth shape and position long before the advent of modern astronomical tools like satellites and telescope. So long before men was able to look out at space to, and, and satellites were out there to give a picture of what it looks like. If you should ask men in, 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 in early civilizations, they believed in a flat earth. But look at what the Bible teaches us. Job was able to talk about how the earth was suspended and nothing. So Job described the earth suspended over nothing and it aligns with the understanding of earth's position in space. What did Job say in Job 26, 7? He stretched out the north out of an empty space and hung the earth upon nothing. Let me quote that again. He stretched out the north over the empty place and hung the earth upon nothing. When we analyze the verse, it suggests that the earth is suspended in space without any visible support. So the concept remarkably aligns with modern astronomical observation. We confirm the earth is held in its position by gravity rather than being physically attached to any other structure, which is what they believe. If I can tell you, some, some ancient religions believe that the earth was on some big turtle back or some crazy things. As a matter of fact, people like Christopher Columbus and these men, one of the reasons why they didn't, they took so long to discover what we call the modern world is because they believed that if you go too far out, you would have fallen off the earth because they saw it as one flat 
thing. That's what they held on to. They believed, praise God, that the world was on, was built on something. But Job clearly told us that the earth was held out into space and nothing held it. When they got satellite and they brought it out of space, they realized that, look here, really nothing is, no car is holding up, no, no turkey is holding up, no nothing. But guess what? It is as the word of God says. He hung it the earth upon nothing. Isaiah talk about the sheep of the earth. Isaiah referring to the circle of the earth, anticipate the spherical understanding confirmed by modern astronomy. What did Isaiah say? He said, it is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. When we analyze the verse, the term circle in this verse can be interpreted to mean a round or a spherical shape. And guess what? It anticipates the modern understanding of the earth as a sphere. It aligns with scientific discoveries about the earth's curvative and shape. So Isaiah got this long before man had satellite. Long before man had a had, 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 um, telescope to look out of space. But it was not just Isaiah alone. This is the verse that is often used by apologists. When we look at Proverbs chapter 8, verse 27, it says, When he prepared the heavens, I was there when he set a compass upon the face of the dead. The word compass here such as a round or a circular form. We can look at Job chapter 22, verse 14. It says, Thick clouds are the covering to him that he saith not, and he walketh in the circuit of heaven. The term circuit implies a round path or circle. So the biblical description of the earth's suspension in space and its shape this demonstrate to us a remarkable alignment with modern scientific understanding. Job, I say, in Job 26, 7, depicts earth hanging upon nothing, a concept resonant with the earth's suspension in space due to gravitational forces. And in Isaiah chapter 40, the earth is described as a circular sphere. And again, all of this harmonizes with scientific discoveries that came many, 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 many centuries later. Brethren, what am I saying to us, brothers and sisters? The word of God is true. We can defend it. When somebody says, boy, you, you, you don't have to live by this modern book, what we get to realize is that most of the modern uh, things are better. People say you don't have to live by this ancient book. What we realize is that this ancient book is more modern than where we are. It's more up-to-date than we were. There are things to be discovered that the Bible already spoke about. <laughs> My God. Now let us look at methods of defending the, the word. First of all, in defending the word, method number one, and I'm coming down, you must have a knowledge of the Bible. You go back to the lesson that we said in lesson two of, lesson two in terms of the power of the word, part two, I should say where Paul encouraged Timothy to study to show himself approved, to be diligent, to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing God's word of truth. You must have a knowledge of the Bible. When you have a knowledge of the Bible, then when they come with certain things, you're able to realize that, look here, the Bible already tells us this. You have to lose logic and reasoning. And even though tonight we did not, in, in the sense of, going into the laws of logics and in the law of non-contradiction. And, and I would not be teaching this in a Bible study session, but all the laws, the basic laws of logic, what we call the laws of non-contradiction, the law of excluded middle, uh, and all of these different basic laws of logic, you got to realize that you can use them because guess what? The Bible supports them. The Bible said, Paul, as his mother was, went in unto them and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scripture opening and alleging that Christ must have suffered, and I underline must, and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. He used logic and evidence to explain and defend biblical truth. You don't need to shy away from these things. All of these things that they come with, amen, you can prove to them that, look here, logic says that this must happen. For example, people would say Jesus did not die on the cross. You have, you have the, 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 the swoon theory where he just fell into a deep trance. But if we know anything about the Romans, 
it will tell you that Lucio Gius was dead. They were experts at execution. People will make point that he did not raise from the dead because there was no empty tomb. But the Bible tells us that Lucio, they would have said these things that the, the, the disciples stole the body. But the disciples never had the means to go and steal the body. <laughs> Matter of fact, they themselves were in hiding. And the Bible teaches these things. There is so much logical things. So we can understand through the scripture, through reasoning, that Christ must have suffered and he rose from the dead. We can use logic and reason to understand. Look here. When the Bible says that it is he that sitteth upon the circles of the earth. Reason and logic. Look here. The Bible tells us that the earth was circular. Logics. <laughs> that's, that's basic reason. And Paul used it. Paul reasoned with them from the scriptures. Mr. Dumatry, use your personal testimony. The Bible says, and they overcame him by the blood of a lamb and by the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives unto the death. Sharing your personal experience of how the word has impacted your life is important because while the Bible is historically correct, while the Bible is scientifically correct, while we can use cosmology and archaeology and all of these things and all these external things to prove the internal things of scripture. The, the word of God did something in your life. And guess what? You overcome the dragon by this. Some persons may not be able to express clearly everything that has been said. But they can speak without the shadow of a doubt what the word of God has done for them. I was this. And therefore, but the word of God has changed me. My heart was like this. But the word of God has changed me. What a God. Lastly, method number four, you can depend upon the Holy Ghost. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Rely on the Holy Spirit for wisdom and for guidance. You can defend the word of God by relying on God's Spirit. The Holy Spirit will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that he has said to you through the word. That's why it's important to go back to point one that you get to know the word so that the Holy Ghost can work upon that. When they come with contradictory things, eventually all of these things that they say, praise God, is going to be proven incorrect because the word of God, heaven and earth, the Bible says, will pass away before one jot or one tittle of God's word, amen, is passed. It is true. Historically, it's true. So the harmony between biblical truth an empirical evidence is a testament to the divine depth of scripture, wisdom, and guidance for our lives. What am I saying to somebody as we continue on the topic? We look at all of these things, all of these intersection between science and history, and we, we got a deeper understanding that, look here, even what they thought was not true is proven to be true. So guess what, brothers and sisters? So shall my word be, the Bible said, that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but shall accomplish that which I please and shall prosper in the thing where I have sent it. If the word of God was true historically, the word of God was true scientifically, that I'm here to tell somebody that the word of God provides for you personally now protection and preservation and healing and guidance. Psalms 91 verse 1 to 4 says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers and under His wings shall thou trust. His truth, which is the word, shall be thy shield and thy butler. What am I saying? The word of God can protect you. It can preserve you. Psalms 121 verse 78. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Bible said the Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and forevermore. If it's reliable historically, it's reliable in my life. Proverbs 2 verse 8 says, He that keep the path of judgment and preserve thy ways for his sins. God can preserve you. Amen. Not only can he preserve you, the word can heal you. The Bible says in Psalm 107 verse 20, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. 
Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20, 22. My son, attend to my words and clear thy ears to my saying. Let not thine heart depart from thine ears. Let not them depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thy heart. For they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgression, Habba. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. He can give us guidance. Psalms 19, 78. The love of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. 2 Timothy 3, 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. Psalm 119, verse 10. Where it all shall a young man cleanse his ways by taking heed to the word of God. Not only does it give us healing, it gives us comfort and strength. Psalms, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 29 to 31. He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, it increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. And the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Psalm 46 verse 1. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in summary. In closing, I want us to understand that we can defend the word. We can defend the word even though our very lives. For the word of God protects and preserves. The word of God heals. The word of God guides and provides wisdom. The word of God comforts and strengthens. And we can rest in that because we can know this is true. Because everything else that they have tried to prove that were a myth, we see where the Bible has come out to be the champion. It's historically reliable. Every biology mentioned in it in terms of is true. Every chemistry mentioned in it is true. We talk about cleansing. We talk about how we how we should deal with different situations. The Bible has already recorded this. The Bible highlights the multifaceted ways in which God's word acts as a source for spiritual and physical support for the believer. I'm here to tell somebody that there is power in the word. Praise God. Tonight, we have dealt with how to defend the word. We have two more places to go. How do I apply the word of God to my life? And at the end of the day, we're going to look at the transformative power of the word of God. Tonight, I pray, God, that we have learned something in relation to the word. And I pray, God, that, you know, that somebody's heart was encouraged. Because not only is this book a book just for moral purpose, but it's historically true. The science in it is true. Amen. The archaeology, which proves the history, comes to the point that, look here, we can trust in the word of God. Tonight, I'm, I want to encourage somebody that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You don't have to doubt when people come with all kinds of things. I said, about the Bible, for years, I said, before, they, they, they said the Hittites didn't exist. For years, they say, where's Ur of the Chaldeans? For years, they look for the walls of Jericho. For years, they say, where is Hezekiah's tunnel? But guess what? It's just a matter of time. Time is the master of all things. For everything, there's a season and a time. And I believe that for you, child of God, this is the season for you to realize that look, you can trust soul in the word. God has given us so much information. We are on an information highway. So much knowledge for us to know, trust that the word of God, praise God, is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. God bless you. I'm going to close here. Just bow your heads as I close out in prayer. Great God, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for your love, your mercy, your grace, your loving kindness. We thank you for your word. We thank you that there is power in your word. Power to save. Power to keep. Power uh, Jesus, so we stand upon the word of God. Everything else is sinking sand, but your word is the solid rock. Your word is that sure foundation. 
I pray God that you'll bless the hearts of every person who participated in this Bible study tonight. Oh God, let our hearts, God, be touched tonight, knowing that we can rest upon your word. Years ago, there was a message that was preached that says, ah, hallelujah, words to rest upon. We are encouraged tonight that we can rest upon your word. We understand that everything that is written is true. We understand that, Jesus, that you are the author of the word and you are truth. You are the way, the truth, and the life. Continue to bless us, Lord Jesus, as we look to you, who is our great God, our author, the finisher of our faith. We love you tonight. We tell you thanks. Continue to bless the House of Faith chapter. Continue to bless every hearer of this Bible study tonight. And help us, Lord Jesus, to continue to do your will and to do your work in the most exalted name, the name by which demons tremble, the name which is above every name, the name of Jesus. We thank you tonight and we call it done in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Remember the Esquire practice tomorrow. Praise God. Remember that on Sunday, service is going to be over and early. So we need to ensure that we come out so we can, you know, have, get our full dose of what is going, God is about to give us on Sunday. But God bless you tonight. Amen. Stay blessed. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen.